Do you think this is also like why it's just so incredibly hard to rock Bitcoin in general? Just understanding the reason of existence that we are just starting to talk about here is already A, complex, but B, also something that, especially in a Western country, you just never thought about, right? You got the coins, you got the bills, you get a bread when you go to the store as a child, that's money. I would say so. Like, it's a really interesting question. The way our governments and the way societies have been structured is we are accustomed to intervention. We're accustomed to people in positions of power saying, okay, you know what, we're going to put this regulation in place. We're going to legislate this. We're going to do this. We're going to support you. And so we've become so accustomed to intervention, creating the world around us, that we can't imagine how could a free market, just people existing, self-regulate? How can a free market naturally find equilibrium in prices? People really struggle with that. I think that that's where I really admire Bitcoin is because we're able to take a step back and start to look at things from this kind of Austrian economic perspective, which is, well, the free market has an incredible ability to adapt to the environment around us. And what is interesting is even up until this point, Every other species, every other environmental interaction has just been through more of a free market natural evolution. Pete, things find equilibrium based upon supply and demand, balance, you name it. And as humans, we just have a tendency, I think, because of consciousness to constantly intervene. And it's just like, how do we as a society just educate people? Intervention is not the answer. On a large scale, intervention is not the answer. We need to step back and allow the flow of supply and demand prices to self-regulate. All right, Seb Bunny, welcome to Bitcoin for Millennials. Ah, it's honestly, it's such a pleasure to be here, Bram. I really value just the, the work and the content you can contribute to the space. And so it's, it's honestly, it's my pleasure. Likewise, man, I love to dive into your book because you wrote a book called The Hidden Cost of Money, which became a number one bestseller. That's a great thing to add to, to your resume, I think. I wanted to ask you to start, if there's one thing that people need to understand about the current financial system, and you know, basically we all live in the same fiat you know, debt-based fiat money system all around the world. What is that one thing? You know, and I, I touch on this a few times in the book, but there's this one phrase that really resonates with me. And that phrase is everything is downstream of money. I think when we have a broken monetary system, the majority don't quite grasp just how much of an influence that is on how they show up in life, how it impacts our environment, how it impacts our politics, how it impacts businesses, just basically how it impacts the fabric of the world around us. And so I think that for me, and as I'm sure listeners kind of are starting to grasp, money is profoundly powerful. When money is broken, it really does weave its influence into everything. So I would say like, if there's one thing, it would be everything is downstream of money. Yeah, this was obviously one of the, one of the questions I wrote down, which was, what does it mean when people say everything is downstream from the money? Like, can we, can we dig into that a bit? And I think like a primer, what, what really helped me is... You know, if I'm party A and you are party B and I offer something and you want to buy that from me, right? We use money, we use bills and coins to represent what the value is that we trade, right? So I say, I offer A for 1000 currency units and you say, well, I'll, I'll pay 800 and then I say, well, 900 and you say, okay, we shake hands. We basically, through the amount of the units, we communicate what, well, whatever I'm offering is worth, right? So it creates some sort of incentives. Yeah, that, that was kind of like the, the concept that did it for me. Is that something that you can elaborate on? For sure. So when we look at money, I think most of us look at money from that basic perspective that, well, it's just a medium of exchange. It's this thing that we exchange back and forth to offer value, to purchase value from others. And the way that I tend to look at money is from a slightly different lens. And that is like language, Money is a medium of expression. It's how we express to the world what it is that we value. Now, if I walk into a grocery store and I see someone buying grass-fed beef and organic vegetables, and then I see another person going and purchasing candy, cigarettes, and microwave meals, you can see what it is they value through what it is that they purchase. And so when you take a step back and look at society as a whole, based on where capital flows in society, you can see what society values. Does it value domestic like locally produced products? Does it value war? Does it value whatever it is? Like you can see based on where money flows, what society values. But the problem, like language, is that it can be censored. And so things like inflation, where our purchasing power is decreasing, where prices are rising, is a form of censorship. If our purchasing power is decreasing, that gives us less capacity to express what we value. The same thing is true with regulation. If there are regulations in place, that impact our ability to spend money where we see fit, to say, hey, you can spend money here, but you can't spend it there, that is impacting our ability to express ourselves. 
And lastly, like if you take China, for instance, when you have capital controls in place that say you're not allowed to move money outside of the country, well, the government's doing that so it can continue to fund its debt obligations, so it can continue to fund its trajectory. And so it wants to lock in as much capital in the country and devalue that capital to fund operations. Well, what does that mean for the individual? If the individual wants to protect his family and in doing so wants to invest overseas to protect purchasing power, they can no longer do that. So their ability to express themselves to support their family is being impacted. So when I look at money, I think of it as it's a medium of expression. It's how we express to the world what we value. And when money starts breaking down, when we start seeing things like inflation, capital controls, uh, regulation, what ends up happening is it actually impacts our ability to express ourselves. And I would argue that many of the byproducts that we face in society, whether it is consumerism, environmental destruction, depression, anxiety, these type of things, they stem from a broken monetary system. And just to give like one more quick little analogy, what is interesting is the reason why expression is so important is very, very clear when we look at psychology. So if as a kid, our parents didn't allow us to express certain emotions, let's say anger or frustration or sadness, so they suppress those emotions, didn't allow those emotions, as an adult, we would grow up and we've got a much greater propensity for depression. What is depression? Depression is the depressing of emotions. We don't know how to express ourselves. The same is true for money. If in a society we cannot express ourselves monetarily and direct capital to where we see fit, society starts to break down. We start to see all these byproducts. And so to your question, the way I look at money is money is just a medium of expression. It's how we express to the world what we value, but it can be corrupted. Oh, so many threads to pull on. I, I don't want to take us directly off to the deep end, but I'll, 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 I'll trust you with the answer to this. Like if you say it's a medium of expression, right? Like it, and I love I love that, by the way, you know, I show what I think is important. Yeah. Like you said, like I either buy candy or it's grass fed beef, but, and, and so this permeates all throughout everything, right? Like e even in, in like the, pu the public space, like I love, I saw this meme where it says like uh, hard money. And then you see like the Trevi fountain in Rome, right? And then you see like soft, soft money. And then you see like, I don't know, like this super ugly 2023 <laughs> fountain, <laughs> like just it's just ugly. It's objectively ugly, right? Mm -hmm. And the Trevi Fountain is objectively beautiful. If it, if it influences like our the way of expressing ourselves or making choices that we want to make, and this is the deep end question, I think, <laughs> does it actually impact like our free will or or like the 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 perceived free will that we have if we are boxed in already with wh however we want to express ourselves? Is that then the case? I would say absolutely. And the reason why I say that is it's not necessarily free will, but it changes our decision-making process. Mm. And so when we think about how money impacts behavior, I think that's an important place to start because wherever we go in this conversation, ultimately, whether it is our environment we're talking about, whether it is politics, whether it is business, whether it is whatever, ultimately, what's changing at the root is our behavior as individuals. And yeah. so first, I think it's important to dive into that. So how does it impact our behavior? Well, I tend to look at it from three different perspectives. The first, which Bitcoin is maybe familiar with, is time preference. Well, when money is worth less over time, that means it's worth its greatest in this present moment. What does that do? That incentivizes us to be focused on the present moment. That means we have a high time preference. We want to meet our immediate needs. And so all of a sudden, when money is breaking down, people are increasingly impulsive, focused on meeting their needs in this present moment, and they're not thinking about the future and meeting security and prosperity needs that are down the line because they're just immediately focused on the now. That's kind of the first stage. When money breaks down, it impacts our ability to think about the future, whether we're thinking about the now or whether we're thinking about the family and the, the uh, and security in the future. And then secondly, is like compassion and altruism. Now, when we think about the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and people have probably seen this triangle, the triangle at the base has our basic needs, which are we need security, we need food, we need shelter. Now, unless we get these basic needs met, food and shelter, we can't think about things like relationships. We can't think about things like compassion and altruism. It's very hard for us to think about bigger questions, spiritual questions, you name it. So what ends up happening is when money starts breaking down and our cost of living is rising, it becomes harder for us to be able to meet our basic needs, food and shelter, which then starts to impact how we're showing up. We don't, have the, uh, we don't have as much capacity to give back to society, to have compassion for others, to contribute to community, you name it. And so there's another change when money breaks down, it's impacting our ability to give back. And then lastly, it's kind of meaninglessness and apathy. 
when we think about money breaking down and our cost of living is rising and it becomes harder to buy a house, it becomes harder to support ourselves, but all of a sudden it's very easy for things like meaninglessness and apathy to set in because as humans, we want to be able to have comfort. We want to be able to have security. We want to be able to plan for the future. I want to be able to save and purchase a house and I want to have an idea about, okay, what is it going to take me to be able to work and save for this property? But if that property is increasing quicker than I can save or show up in this world, then all of a sudden meaninglessness and apathy are going to stead in. And so I think that these are kind of just three quick examples, but they're highlighting how when money starts to break down, it starts to impact how we show up as people. It starts to impact our decision-making process. And that leads to, as you were just talking about, things like building uh, construction, rather than spending time and thinking about, you know what, this is something I want to give to community and I want it to resemble the the prosperity and the abundance we have in society. Instead, people are like, I just need to build this as cheaply and quickly as possible so I can get onto the next thing because I just need to survive. So I think this is where money really does influence how we as individuals are showing up. Does your Bitcoin custody setup keep you up at night? Gain peace of mind with OnRamp and their multi-institution custody solution. OnRamp creates a dedicated multi-signature vault for you and three separate institutions each hold a key, which are OnRamp, Bitco, and CoinCover. But none of them can move funds unilaterally, only you have control. These institutions can only sign with your instruction. OnRamp's multi-institution custody eliminates single points of failure, reduces your personal attack service and technical burden, and provides access to financial services that allow you to secure your Bitcoin, including inheritance planning, insurance-backed warranties for all balances and transactions, low-cost trading, and more. Check out onrampbitcoin.com through my link in the description below and receive $250 in Bitcoin when you join. If you want to self-custody your Bitcoin stack, I recommend the Foundation Passport, a premium Bitcoin-only hardware wallet. I've been using mine for about a year now, and I love the design and ease of use. And with Foundation's mobile wallet companion app Envoy, your initial onboarding is super smooth and straightforward. The Passport is fully air-gapped, which means you never have to connect it to the internet or any computer. The Passport serves as a signing device to sign transactions on your Envoy app, or any of your other favorite software wallets like Sparrow or Blue Wallet. The Foundation Passport also offers encrypted backups on a micro SD card and is built with 100% open source hardware and software. I love what Zach and the team at Foundation are building. And to learn more about their mission, please check out episode 27 of this podcast. If you consider buying a Foundation Passport, you can use code BRAM, that's B-R-A-M, to get $10 off at foundation.xyz slash BRAM. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like on that last part, it's kind of like if I'm the architect of that building and I need to get paid too, and I need to spend it as quickly as possible, I'm not incentivized to create value, right? Or beauty or function or, you know, however you would want to define any architectural design. And when, when, when I talk to people sometimes, right, and they talk about what they, they ask me, like, why do you talk about money all the time or this Bitcoin thing, you know? And for example, they are really into the environment or, you know, whatever I say, like, Everything you would ever want to fix in the world is broken because the money is broken, right? I think that's a different sentence for saying, you know, everything is downstream from the money. But I love where you touched upon these incentives, right? Because things only get to a certain situation or get into some sort of shape or form because people, there are people that do that, right? They take some sort of action and they actually do that. Actually, in my country, there was a big scandal of a, I think it's a steel factory, And they took waste, apparently, out on boats into the ocean and they illegally dumped it and had a conversation about this where I was thinking, okay, but there's this guy who's like on the boat, right? He's steering the boat. And that's just his job. And he has a family that he has to feed. And he's just going on the boat. He has this assignment. And then, you know, he gets to a certain, you know, uh, certain coordinates. And then he pushes a button and he dumps it in the ocean, right? And then he just goes back and there was a shift and then he goes home and, and, you know, he has... He, he earned money for his family. And I think that is a great example of, you know, you would want to fix not only that that company is doing that, but that someone lends themselves to actually do that, right? But we we don't have to talk, we should not talk like about capitalism and all these things. We should talk about how broken the money is, right? So mm-hmm. it's kind of like, you know, peeling another four layers of what you might see on the TV as a discussion or a scandal or something, right? Like, we should talk more about 
the money is broken and broken money creates broken incentives. And therefore people are, I'd say, less collaborative also, right? Less reflective, not on purpose, but just be basically because they are forced to in a in a subconscious way. They don't really realize what they're contributing to. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, I think as humans, we have a propensity to want to interact and intervene and to create change. And on a small micro level, that's totally fine. If you want to intervene in your child's life, if you want to support them, that's I fully support that. But the thing is, when we start dealing with nation states, when we start dealing with major economic systems, our environment, these are huge, complex adaptive systems. And if we go and start tinkering on these major systems, as humans, we struggle to think about the unintended consequences, the second, the third, the fourth order effects of our actions. And that's where when we think about money, what I think obviously Bitcoin is recognized is we need a money that is separate from state, that everyone is playing by the same rules that people can't act self-interestedly and create all these unintended consequences. And it's interesting, I just went to a Bitcoin meetup down in the city talking about intervention. And I gave kind of these three different analogies as to where we have intervened in the past and we never thought about the repercussions of our intervention. And the first one is, people have probably heard about the 1983 to 1985 Ethiopian famine. And there was a big live aid concert in London where they had Freddie Mercury, a bunch of huge bands playing to raise money for the famine in Ethiopia. That on the surface of things sounds phenomenal. Like, I want to support that. I want to donate to this cause. Well, what ended up happening? Well, the reason why they were having the famine was because there was a communist Marxist government that was basically in war with the rebels. And when they ended up donating all of this food and money and resources to Ethiopia, it ended up prolonging the war. It ended up actually fueling the communist government so the communist government could continue to do what they wanted to do. So when you look back, you're like, okay, on the face of it, we want to intervene because we want to do something better. But we end up creating all these byproducts. We extended the war, prolonged the, the frustration, prolonged the torment with the locals. And the second one that I kind of discussed was the Tom's Shoes. About 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, there was Tom's Shoes and people freaking love them. And I think Tom's Shoes blew up because they had this idea that for every one pair that people bought, we're going to go and donate a pair to a third world country or developing country. So over the course of this campaign, they donated 95 million pairs of shoes. On the face of it, again, this looks amazing. And I really appreciate that, okay, we're trying to give back to society. But what ended up happening is when you donate 95 million pairs of shoes, All of these communities suddenly had access to free shoes. So what did it do? Well, it put all the shoemakers out of business. So the shoemakers then didn't have any work. So they were out of business. And then within six months to a year, once people wear through the shoes, suddenly now that community becomes dependent on handouts because there's no one to make shoes. And then the last one I'll just quickly mention on is the Yellowstone Fire of 1988, which is the 100 years up until 1988 in Yellowstone National Park in the US, they decided they're going to have a fire suppression policy. Anytime there's a tiny little fire, they're going to put it out. They're going to make sure this is a national park. We want to preserve this national park. And so they put out all the fires. And then in 1988, because of this accumulation of kindling and dry brush that had not been wiped clear through little forest fires, there was a small spark and it ended up burning down one third of the national park. And so again, intervention on a grand scale in a complex system, as humans, looking at it from a simplistic view, we can't think about all of the consequences of our actions. And so I believe this is why we face so many of the challenges we face in society is because we think money is this simple thing, this thing that we're just interacting with. It's just a medium of exchange. But when we suppress interest rates and incentivize debt consumption, when we print money, when we do handouts, it creates so many of the byproducts at which we face. Yeah, great examples. I think I want to dive, of course, into Bitcoin later, but the thought that, that, that is triggered is like, again, great examples because... It is so complex, right? So even the people starting Tom's, even the people doing the live aid thing, they all think they're doing a good thing, right? And on the surface, it looks like a, a good thing, but they, again, not consciously, but they, they just don't understand what is behind the thing that they are trying to solve, right? And do you think this is also like why it's just so incredibly hard to, to grok Bitcoin in general, right? Like just understanding the reason of existence, you know, that we are just starting to talk about here is already A, complex, but B, also something that 
especially in a Western country, you just never thought about, right? You cut the coins, you cut the bills, you get a bread when you go to the store as a child. Yeah, that's money. I would, I would say so. I think like, it's a really interesting question. And I think that the way our governments and the way societies have been structured is we are accustomed to intervention. We're accustomed to people in positions of power saying, okay, you know what? We're going to put this regulation in place. We're going to legislate this. We're going to do this. We're going to support you. And so we've become so accustomed to intervention, creating the world around us, that we can't imagine that how could a free market, just people existing, self-regulate? How can Mm -hmm. a free market naturally find equilibrium in prices? Like, People really struggle with that. And I think that that's where I really admire Bitcoin is because we're able to take a step back and start to look at things from this kind of Austrian economic perspective, which is, well, the free market has an incredible ability to adapt to the environment around us. And what is interesting is even up until this point, every other species, every other like environmental interaction has just been through more of a free market natural evolution. Things find equilibrium based upon supply and demand, balance, you name it. And as humans, we just have a tendency, I think, because of consciousness to constantly intervene. And it's just Mm. like, how do we as a society just educate people? Intervention is not the answer. On a large scale, intervention is not the answer. We need to step back and allow the flow of supply and demand prices to self-regulate. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's where that thought of free will kind of or or autonomy or something kind of weaves into, right? Like we don't we don't even think that we would be capable of doing so because we are already just so embedded in this system, right? But I'm thinking of like my background is in uh, working with like early stage startups and stuff like that. And so I always focused on like, you can build anything, but there has to be a foundation, right? Like why does this exist? And if your foundation is flawed, but you still start a company, you still try to get customers, et cetera. Let's say you're you're working on it for two years, and then you ask a question: Well, how's it actually going? You know, or I don't have as many customers or users as I want. Like, how can I how can I fix that? And you start putting band aids on the business, basically. Mm-hmm. But what happens actually most most of the times, because also because most ideas suck, and that is totally okay. There is no foundation. There's there's not a good foundation, right? So the the foundation is already corrupted, even without the founders for example, knowing it, and they still build upon it. And anything they want to change is basically a band-aid, but it's not, it's not pulling apart the foundation. It's not setting a new foundation. And I think how you were just describing that is like any, any policy or any economic idea is basically trying to change what is in essence a, f- a flawed idea, mm-hmm. fiat money, right? At least for the people that are not the creators of, the, of that money. Right. I was just going to say, like, what yeah. comes to mind as you're saying that is a perfect example is the the medical system. Like, there's certain incentives whereby if you're a doctor and someone comes to you and says, "Hey, I'm feeling this way and these are my symptoms," doing nothing is also a decision. And sometimes it's doing exactly. nothing that actually allows the body to find that equilibrium and move through it. But the problem is the incentives of the doctor. If I was to say, you know what, I think we need a little more time to see how this develops. The problem is in the small chance that that person gets sick or dies, the doctor is now liable because the doctor did nothing. So we have a system that incentivizes intervention. And it's the same with politics. If a politician, when the pandemic started, if the politician said, okay, you know what? We need to be able to see how this develops and we need to have more clarity around how society is going to function. We're going to step back and observe. Then they can become liable if it gets way worse. And so instead they intervene and we never know what that potential path is with no intervention. And so from yeah. there, they could say, well, I intervene because if I didn't, then this could have happened. And so we have a system yeah. that incentivizes intervention. Yeah, this is also, this actually what I want to also say, like this is where it touches for me, like spirituality or that autonomy part is like, we aren't even able to allow ourselves to experience life in, in some way, right? So something happens, we we intervene, you know? and. Only afterwards we know if that was a good idea. But as you said, like the default is already to to intervene. And I think it's it, 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 to take it back to economics. When I heard economics is not a science, it's actually yeah, it's not an exact science. It's like a social science. I was like, what? Okay, that's interesting. Like when I was in high school, we were like calculating stuff all the time, right? So how is it a social science? And it's basically yeah, what are the parameters in which 
or, or like the, what's like the framework in which people can trade and uh, the rules of money and all these things. And, and that just sounded so illogical to me, like how you just described free market. So I don't have a finance or economics background, by the way. So when I heard like free market, everyone, you know, there's one money, everyone just tries what they think, you know, has value in whatever capacity. And that's, you know, how we discover what people actually value and the people who bring enough value, they, their business survives and other businesses don't. And when I thought about it like that, I was like, is this then real capitalism? That's how I would understand capitalism, right? Like, okay, if you are good enough, you earn economic energy, you can store that to build it out and you can spend it on other people, you know, reward them with economic energy. That's kind of how the picture for Bitcoin also for me became more clear after I looked at it like from a technological perspective. But when I under like kind of started thinking about that, I don't want to say I truly understand it, you know, to the core, but just that idea of, yeah, of course there should be a free market, but there isn't a free market as mm -hmm. you just alluded to. Like there's all these, all these frameworks overlapping also. It's very confusing, right? And I think, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. The main thing, I'll, I'll end with that, but the main thing is if, if there are people, there's someone in the UK, there's someone in the Congo and someone in Thailand that do the exact same thing, deliver the exact same value, expend the exact same energy. They are, the, they are rewarded and therefore valued at a different level just because of the money that is used for that human effort. And that to me sounds really bad because then everything is just random. Like I'm, I'm born in a rich country. Well, good for me, but you know, could have been born in central Africa, right? Like it's just, it, it just devalues human life in this. Mm -hmm. No. And you know, what comes to mind as you're saying that is when we think about money and we think about things like capitalism, it gets such a bad rap. And the reality mm. is capitalism is effectively just evolution. It is people are yes. going out into the yeah. world and they're taking yeah. the resources that are around them and they're combining them to create value for society. And those that are able to create those resources and offer more value are the ones that thrive and survive. Well, it's the same thing with evolution. Those that have been able to use their environment better than their competitor outperformed. And what that does is as a species, we move towards growth and advancement because we all benefit and we all reap the rewards that's of the things incentive. like that's the incentive. That's the technological yeah. advancement. And the thing that I find really, really tough is today, the left, when we approach things from maybe a socialist agenda or more Marxist agenda, what ends up happening is we may be trying on the surface to support everyone. We want diversity. We want equality. We want inclusion. But what we're actually doing is we're impacting humanity's ability to thrive moving forward. Because if we're distributing wealth, if we're redistributing wealth, what we're actually doing is we're taking capital away from productive individuals and giving it to unproductive individuals. And I think that the government should not make that decision. If we as individuals are able to offer value, we should be able to choose how we want to spend that capital. And many of us may choose to give back to society. Many of us may choose to support others in our community. Exactly. But that's your decision. That's not the government's decision. And that's where I think as a society, for us to be able to thrive, for us to be able to thrive, we need to be able to allow capital to flow to where value is being created in society. And that's so important. If we're bailing out big businesses, supporting whole sectors that shouldn't exist, we're being incredibly unproductive and we're destroying otherwise productive capital. Yeah bailing out companies uh, yeah why you know <laughs> that's that's then the question i have like it's not uh, why would someone else decide that this company is so important that you know the monetary energy that i gathered right my savings should be devalued because i don't know james knows john <laughs> who runs that company you know i think that when I started in, in Bitcoin, like I don't like the words of corruption and theft and stuff like that. Like for me, those are really hard words. And I think they could, could pull people away from, I think, the importance of, of what we are talking about. Right. But when you really think about it, it is that, you know, mm -hmm. it's just other people that take care of other people. That's not you because you don't know the reason why, basically. Yeah. And you still have the consequences of the fact that that's happening. And yeah, before we jump to Bitcoin, but but Bitcoin in essence takes all of that away, right? Like it just blows away all these, it, the existing playing field, the frameworks and all these things. It just redistributes the opportunity, I would mm -hmm. say, for anyone to create and then also get rewarded in value. 100%. It allows for the natural market, the natural environment to find that equilibrium. And 
what blew me away once, I was listening to a What, Bit, a what Bitcoin Did podcast and it was with Lynn Olden. It was probably about a year ago. And she had mentioned something that I'd never heard before. And that was that before the 1930s depression, there was a 1920s depression. Mm. And I was just like, a 1920s depression? I'd never, I thought that was flourishing throughout the 1920s. And supposedly, well, not supposedly, I've done research and dug into this, but basically the 1930s depression, we saw absolute carnage. We saw unemployment skyrocket. We saw the stock market completely tank, asset prices tank. I think it took something like 25 years for people to get back to where they were at the previous high in the stock market. Like that's immense capital destruction. And then you hear about the 1920s depression, which had the same unemployment rate, very similar drop in the financial markets, and it recovered within a year. Well, why did that happen? Up until that point, the Federal Reserve only came into being in 1913. And the Federal Reserve had not put in place regulation and legislation to be able to intervene to the same extent that it was able to in the 1930s. And so a free market was kind of the natural environment that the 1920s depression took place in, which enabled, if you were a fiscally irresponsible business, if you'd borrowed beyond your means, you would have gone out of business. And now as a business owner, you've now got an incentive. If I've got to support my family, I've got to make money. So I've got to go back out into the workforce. I've got to either find a job or I've got to start a business. And so all of a sudden, we had a bunch of unemployment and then we had a huge boom of people going back out into the market, creating businesses, and then the economy rebounded and it flourished. But the problem is when we have intervention, as we're just talking about, when you start bailing out unproductive businesses, fiscally irresponsible businesses, well, all of a sudden we start creating all of these byproducts. And those byproducts impact things like innovation. Like in in the States, 40% of small to medium-sized businesses are zombie companies, which basically means they're not generating enough revenue to cover their debt obligations. You said 40? 40, 40, 40. What is mind-blowing about this is that that means that if you are a company who is actually offering value, two out of every five of your competitors are companies that shouldn't exist. So now, instead of directing capital towards research and development, innovating, which benefits society, you're now having to direct capital towards competition. So that's now impacting society's ability to flourish. And so we're now, so much capital goes towards competition against entities that should not exist as a result of intervention. That, that actually blew my mind. That's crazy. Now, but it's just, it's just such a waste, right? Like it's just, this entire conversation around, yeah, should you bail out companies? Should you sh- save the economy, etc.? It feels for me like it's it all goes against any human desire or need in the yeah. long run, right? Hundred percent. I feel, and you know, when yeah. you take a look at natural environment, I'm talking about like flora, fauna, the animals, the forests. You're never going to see one specific entity get so big that it's going to impact that the rest of the environment around it in the event that that thing collapses. So it's kind of like our biggest animals are elephants and whales. If an elephant or a whale dies, it's not going to impact the elephant species or the whale species. But we're yeah. now allowing co- corporations, multinational corporations grow to grow so big that if they are to break down, it's going to impact society. That should never happen. That doesn't happen in a natural state. Mm-hmm. And I think that the repercussions of this are huge. And this this intervention just does not work. And I'll give one more quick analogy that really impacted me uh, living here in Canada, which is during the pandemic, there was something called the CERB, the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit. And that was, if you saw more than 10% drop in your income as a result of the pandemic, you were entitled to $2,000 a month. Well, $2,000 a month is $24,000 a year. When you take a look at Canadian tax receipts, 30% of Canadians earn under $24,000 a year. So what you've now just done is you've said to one third of Canadians, hey, do you want to work full time to earn your money? Or do you want to be given the same amount of money for free? What are they going to take? They're going to take the latter. So all of a sudden we had a huge like swath of people basically quitting their jobs and going on this emergency response benefit. And all of a sudden low income jobs, such as cafes, bike shops, restaurants, they couldn't find any workers. You destroyed all of these mum and pup businesses, and then these multinational corporations were able to tap the government for money, thrived. And so again, we saw this consolidation into these monopolies, and we saw a destruction of the like the small mum and pup businesses as a result of intervention, trying to do something good. So what is what is conventional knowledge about money or economics that is just plain wrong when it's actually observed or analyzed in practice versus 
the theory that, let's say, scholars preach? Do you have an example of that? So I think one of the biggest things is just when you start digging into, say, Keynesian economics, which we, let's just for simplicity, call it interventionistic economics, and Austrian economics, which is more free market, and this belief that the free market knows best, is a complex adaptive system, and prices will find their equilibrium based upon supply and demand. I would say that one of just the the biggest issues we face, all of these challenges we're discussing up until this point, stem from Keynesian economics and this interventionistic practice. And the thing that is so challenging is that we have people going and studying finance. We have people going and studying economics in academic institutions. Well, the problem is they're being taught Keynesian economics. So the thing is, they are only going to have a job if they're intervening. So now we have this incentive. If people are going and studying finance and economics, well, of course they're going to push the interventionistic approach because otherwise they don't have a job. And so under the Austrian approach, the reality is that economics is a completely dead sector. We don't have a need for economics. We don't have a need for economists. We don't have a need for people intervening and telling us what we should be doing with our money because the free market ultimately governs that mechanism. And so I think that one of the biggest things that I think we need to change is how do we re-educate society to step back from money and allow money to find its natural equilibrium? Yeah, I I, I I think what is so interesting is I think it's Maynard Keynes, right? He was in the same class as, was that Hayek or Menger? I think Wild. it's Menger. Menger, right? Yeah, I th- I've, yeah, I've, I've yeah. heard something like that, but it's yeah. just, yeah. Yeah, so so what I understand, and so I think it's 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 interesting to, to pull this towards the, the now, but the day, so the father of Keynesian economics was in the same class as the father of Austrian economics, which is Carl, Carl B. Menger. And Carl B. Menger was a good writer, but a bad speaker, right? And, and Keynes was a good writer and a good speaker. If you, by the way, for the people listening, I just watched a film. You probably know it. I think it's called Hard Money. There you see like, I think it's like a 30 minute film on YouTube. You see like an interview with, with Keynes, like very, very good speaker. Right. But what I find so, I don't want to say funny, but it's kind of like ironic. Like Menger was probably right, but he couldn't talk about it. Like he had like a bad accent or something. Like I I don't, I don't know which country he was from, but like Mm -hmm. he didn't have like a good accent, was not nice to listen to, et cetera. And Keynes was like a really good speaker. And so Menger couldn't really convey the message of his school of economics. And eventually Keynes also with the connections that he have, he basically won or, or got known. Right. But in practice, it doesn't work. So like, it's all talk and no, no walk, basically. Mm-hmm. And I think maybe that's a nice bridge to Bitcoin. You know, when we use Bitcoin as an equalizer for going from soft money to hard money, just blowing away all the wrong incentives, actually fixing, I always say, like our own corruptibility, you know, it forces us to think, how do I add value? If there's a scarce unit of reward, I have to actually add value. There's no free, you know, there's no rent seeking and all these things. Like you have to walk your talk. Basically, you cannot say I bake good breads. Like you have to actually bake good breads, right? Like, or I'm a good teacher or I'm a good policeman or whatever, right? You are confronted with the fact that you actually have to deliver value. And I Mm -hmm. think how Keynes got known is actually everything that's wrong with the current Keynesian ideology on economics. And I think you had a perfect example. Like if you get taught that you should intervene because you studied intervening (laughs) in the economy. And yeah, of course you're going to intervene, right? And you're never going to question, well, what is money? What's the, what's the point of money? What should be the actual characteristics of Mm -hmm. money, right? You, you, you don't go in hard mode. You kind of go in, yeah, manipulation, soft mode, everything is malleable, et cetera. It's as you're talking about that, what comes to mind is Recently, I've had a multitude of people recommend, you know what, Seb, you should read Mein Kampf. And Mein Kampf, obviously, for those that aren't familiar, is kind of Hitler's kind of autobiography. And as I've been reading it, it's been really interesting just to see his perspective on things. Like, I'm not going to make an opinion on obviously what happened in World War II, but one of the things that stood out to me is, and I'm just going to read this short little section, he talks about, is it really an indispensable quality in a statesman that he should possess a gift of persuasion commensurate with his ability to conceive great political measures and to carry them through into practice? Does it really prove that a statesman is incompetent if he should fail to win over the majority of votes in an assembly that has been called together as a chance result of the electoral system? Has there ever been a case where such an assembly 
has worthily appraised a great political concept before that concept was proven a success. And so what's interesting and comes to mind as I read that and listen to that is that we have a system that is built upon supporting people that are able to win over the hearts of others that can talk amazingly. Mm. But that doesn't mean that what they're talking about has actually been thought through. That doesn't mean that there is value in what they're doing. Whereas there are many other individuals, many other intellectuals that do not carry that capacity to persuade, but they have an unbelievable idea that may be able to change the course or the trajectory of humanity. But the problem is because they're not able to persuade, that gets lost or yeah. they end up falling by the wayside. And I think that Maynard Keynes and Menger example is a perfect example of that. One was able to talk the talk and therefore his idea was pushed forward while the other one kind of withered away somewhat. You know what I mean? Yeah. Doesn't this really show, yeah, again, I think like how complex it is, right? Like the, the entire concept of money, I don't know when this started, but it got so abstracted, like literally to the point where you don't have physical stuff in your hands anymore, right? Yeah. It's all digital and and it doesn't even exist in the digital realm until Bitcoin, right? Like I say this to people all the time as well, like the number in your banking app is literally a number in a database. It does not represent anything related to energy. It's not physical, right? Like you, you, you contractually don't even own it when mm -hmm. it's in the bank, you know? So we went from gold coins that we learn about in stories about pirates and trade and all the, and shipwrecks and stuff like that, you know, actual hard money. That's by, uh, by the way, also where sound money comes from. Did you know? Oh, because you can the gold. Now, you when like you drop it, it, it yeah. makes a sound. Yeah, and we went to money that doesn't even exist. Mm -hmm. It's just a number, you know. But it still represents, you know, energy in in time and space. And I wanted to ask you about that. Like, how does that connect to, let's say, the incentives, time preference? Yeah. So I would say this whole discussion we're talking about the challenges we face in society, and the challenges we face stem from intervention. They stem from people being able to intervene. The incentive of our system is to intervene. When you think about a political system, you've got a four-year term, you've got to be seen to be doing something. If you were to step back and say, you know what, I think we should have more clarity around what's going on, so we're going to give space, that political person is probably going to be able to kicked out of office, and someone who says, okay, I'm going to step up and I'm going to give everyone 2,000 bucks, they're going to be voted in. And so because the system allows for intervention, we have a negative feedback loop intervention begets intervention. So the question I think as a society we should be asking is how do we build a system that realigns the incentives? And to me, that is to separate money from state. So all of a sudden, this idea of more of a free market where money flows to where value is being created is supported. So as a, as a government, it's not based upon the actions of the government per se, but more is the government offering value? And if the government is offering value, then capital flows towards them. If the government is not offering value, then capital does not flow towards them and they wither away, which enables someone else to rise up. That is how the free market operates. Mm. If I start a business, no matter what that business is, whether I'm fixing a hot tubs, whether I'm a dentist, whether I'm a man and by constructor, if I do not offer value, money is not going to flow towards me and I've got yeah. to rethink what I'm doing and I've got yeah. to offer value to society. And so I think it's really important to separate money from state and secondly, to have a money with a fixed supply. And the reason why we need that fixed supply is because from the dawn of time, humans have always been trying to get more for less. And I gave that example earlier, through evolution, those that have been able to use their environment better than their competitor outcompeted. So we've always been striving to get more for less, improve our security, improve our productivity, improve our efficiency. And so as a result of this, life should be getting easier. We should have more capacity to show up. Now, yes. the reality is that should show up in the form of falling prices. Prices should be falling. The perfect example of Netflix versus Blockbuster. Blockbuster, you just have to drive down to Blockbuster, spend half an hour in Blockbuster, choosing which movie you wanted to watch, spend your whatever, seven, eight, nine bucks renting the movie, drive back home, watch the movie, drive back to Blockbuster, drop off the movie, drive back home. All of that time and energy to rent one movie. And now for pretty much the same cost, we have Netflix. And at the touch of a button, we have millions of movies on demand. And so... What we're seeing is prices should be falling, but we don't benefit from that because our money supply is expanding at a greater rate than prices should be falling. Yeah. And so what's interesting is if we had a monetary system like Bitcoin with a fixed supply, it reflects society more accurately. What would happen is as productivity increases, as efficiency increases, as there are more goods and services in society, 
prices fall, given that there's a fixed unit of supply. And what that means is that life gets easier. We have greater capacity as individuals to show up more authentically. We have greater capacity to look inwards and say, how do I want to show up in life? What is it that actually I value? Like, how do I want to contribute to society? And that is huge. I think we're going to have a much more abundant and flourishing society if we have more capacity as individuals. At the moment, it's the inverse. We have less and less and less capacity. We're having to work more and more and more just to get ahead. And as parents, we're impacted in our ability to support our kids. And we're getting rising rates of depression, anxiety, you name it, as a result of our ability to not meet our kids' emotional needs. And so these are all byproducts of a broken system. We need a monetary system that separates money from state because it more accurately reflects society's ability to thrive. Yeah. Yeah, I think talking about these two opposing forces, right, that are basically battling each other is a very interesting concept. I, I talked about this before, right? Like, why was the bread 20 cents 50 years ago? Now it's $5 or euros. It's probably nutritionally worse. And we should be able to make better bread 50 years later, right? But if the bread is five euros or dollars, then guess which side is winning, basically? It's the manipulated money side. And I kind of visualize it as like, if you see all the people in the world, right? Like all the productivity that they could apply or, or the energy they could have as, as output, right? Like that's a constantly, that's, a, that's something that's moving constantly because people want to build, create, improve, optimize, all these things, right? And so that will happen one way or another. That's always been the case, right? But if there's, so that's like one side of the equation, but if the other side of the equation is a reward that's constantly changed, devalued, et cetera, then, you know, in a random way also, you know, not, not, not even predictable um, with yeah. good argumentation, right? It's very unpredictable. Then, you know, the, the behavior will also be unpredictable, not go towards a single direction, not unified in any way with regards to, you know, what do we actually want? What do we find important? You know, I think that touches like values, morals, and, and all these things. And I really like the visualization and it's hard to talk about, of course, on a podcast where if you, if you have this reward side as basically as it's not a static thing, it's a constant thing, right? Like a constant thing as in it's the same all the time, everywhere, forever, basically. That's the promise of Bitcoin as a reward. Once you know that the reward will always be of the same hardness, let's say, right? It's just always the same. It's a constant thing then you will be not only incentivized to do the work to figure out if your work actually provides value, but it also gives you, I think, the time and space to actually experiment with what am I here to do? Mm -hmm. You know, what can I actually bring as value? But because, you know, the current reward does not do that, you also have people that do jobs that they hate or they suck at, you know, or they, you know, when they were, there's people in big corporates uh, that uh, are just ghost employees, like they get paid, but they don't do anything. Yeah. People don't have kids, all, all these things. And I think also, man, maybe that's my question. Isn't this why Bitcoin is just so hard to understand? Like, why is this such a big concept to, to grasp eventually? Is there any way for us that we can compare the new paradigm of Bitcoin with this old paradigm that we just talked about for 45 minutes. It's, you know, as you're talking about that, it reminds me, in my book, I kind of discuss these four stages of intervention and why intervention doesn't work. And the first stage is kind of a misalignment to reality. Well, prices should be falling, as I just discussed. We're advancing technology. We're constantly increasing efficiency and productivity. Prices should be falling. Well, the challenge is when we have a debt-based system, when companies are borrowing beyond their means, if prices start falling and it squeezes their profit margins, then they could potentially go out of business. But these companies are too big to fail. So now we have to intervene. We have to bail them out, which leads us yeah. to the second stage, the death of creative destruction. If you don't allow competition to take place, if you don't allow businesses to overtake other businesses and engulf other businesses because businesses are not offering value anymore, then what ends up happening is you see businesses thriving the, the only reason why they're thriving is artificial intervention. It's capital moving towards them that would not otherwise move to them. And that leads to the third stage, capital flow distortion. If capital in society is moving towards businesses that should not exist, we do not get a representation about what is valued in society. And that leads us to the final stage, the fourth stage, decision-making impairment. Complex adaptive systems are constantly making decisions 
and trying to optimize. How can we as a society optimize if we don't know what businesses should be there, what businesses shouldn't, what sectors should exist, what sectors shouldn't? Should mm-hmm. there be a whole financial sector? Should there not be a whole financial sector? Is this valued correctly in society? Is this not valued? Like We cannot make those decisions under a system of intervention. Whereas under a system built upon something like Bitcoin, the complete inverse is true. Instead of having a misalignment reality, we have an alignment reality. Prices reflect what people value, which then means we allow for competition. If a company arises, it arises because it outcompeted its competitor. It arises because it offers more value to society. Everyone benefits. Thirdly, capital flows. Capital flows align with what people value in society. Capital flows toward where value is being created. Yes. And then that lastly means that as individuals, we can make decisions. We can make decisions because we can see what it is that society values. And that is how humanity on a grand scale survives. That's how humanity trends towards growth and prosperity. It is not through intervention where we're trying to make decisions in a system where our measurement stick, our money, is constantly changing. As Preston Pish always talks about, like money is just a measure of value in society. And so if our measurement stick is constantly changing, how can we build a structurally sound society? If you're trying to build a house with a measuring stick where the inch measurement is constantly fluctuating in size, you're not going to have a structurally sound house. And the same is true for money. Yeah, 100%. Like while you're talking, I'm thinking, why do you, why are co- companies like this uh, Temu, Timu or Shine, you know, all this fast fashion stuff, why does it exist? And I think you just said, yeah, because we allow it to. We literally allow it to exist you know, again, totally subconscious, right? But in a world with Bitcoin, we could say like, you know, I wouldn't want to spend my Bitcoin on that. And so you vote with the money you have and you basically vote a company or an institution or a government that doesn't align with the values of the people or the, cons- the you know, customers, etc. You just vote them out of business, basically. Mm-hmm. No, and that's that's really well said. And I think that, One thing that people sometimes struggle to grasp is that it's like capitalism is the result. Sorry, um, consumerism is the result of capitalism. And it's just like, no. Yeah, no. (laughs) Consumerism is the result of deteriorating money that is incentivizing us to spend because our purchasing power is greatest in this present moment. And so what I think is so fascinating is that if we were to move over to a new paradigm, let's just say Bitcoin is the world reserve currency, all of the incentives switch. What does that look like? Let's take consumerism. Can I I add one thing? What you just said? You want to spend your money, what did you just say, in the present moment? Because it oh, has the yeah, most... So when, when our money is worth less over time, it is worth the most in this present exactly, moment. So, exactly. Yeah. So, so I think for people listening, this is what creates this incentive to spend it, to be a consumer, right? Mm-hmm. I, I never heard anyone say that. I, uh, the, the, you te- you're teaching me something, but this is great. This is why you can't save. Mm-hmm. You, know you, can, you know you can't save. And, and that is 100%. what makes you discount the future even more, appreciate, well, not appreciate the now, right? It's kind of like you're forced to use it in the now and therefore it makes you a consumer instead of having a time frame towards the future where you can be an actual yeah. builder. Yeah. No, 100%. And that's where it's interesting, like building on this point. So when money is worth less over time, we're incentivized to consume in the present moment. Also, you get a large portion of the population directing their capital towards goods and services. Well, goods and services require resources, which depletes our waterways, our minerals in our soil, forests, you name it. So we're creating a mass environmental destruction with our consumer habits as a result of deteriorating money. But on the flip side, there's a large portion of the population that don't consume. Well, what do they do? Because money is not storing value, they go and then use other assets in the form of money. So they go and purchase real estate. They go and purchase things like farmland, but they're no longer using them for their utility value. They're no longer using the house to put a roof over their head or the farm to grow crops. They're using them to store value. So now you're taking things that are offering value to society away from society and using them in the form of money. So what is interesting when I think about Bitcoin is that we're going to see increasingly, if we were to see the adoption of Bitcoin, or all of a sudden we're going to be incentivized to save once again. We can simply hold our purchasing power in our currency. We don't have to use real estate. We don't have to use stocks. We don't have to use farmland as a store of value. And so all of a sudden, if people are moving out of these assets back to the currency to save, well, asset prices start to fall. So we start to see reduced consumption because people are incentivized to save. And we start to see life getting easier. 
as our cost of living starts to decline, house prices start to decline, farmland becomes cheaper. So society starts to thrive once again. And that, to me, is when I started to grasp this, when I dove down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, I was just like, this is the direction we need to go. And I think that politically, people think, okay, we need to continue voting left because left are going to support those on the bottom rung of society. What they don't realize is that we've been voting left for so long and life has got harder and harder and harder. Intervention is not the answer. If we want to support those on the bottom rung of society, wouldn't you think that life would be a lot easier if their cost of living was getting cheaper? Mm. It was becoming easier to get a house. It was becoming easier for people to have more capacity to show up and give back to society. And this is what I believe Bitcoin does, is it gives people more autonomy and capacity to show up more wholeheartedly, which benefits all of us. I think this is the Bitcoin pitch, right? No, I think you you touched upon all the all the all the all, all the things that I think are closest to someone's life, right? I think you know in the beginning we talked more about the few layers back from that, you know, or the the cause behind you know the real cause behind the cause behind the cause of the problem you would like to fix in the world. But I think this comes closest, you know, if, if you would propose Bitcoin as a solution to like the things that people find important within their their personal lives. And the, the point you made about the financialization of assets that are created to be used as a utility, I think is also one of the things that at least for me were like a signal where I was like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense that that is a bad thing. It's a bad thing. So it's it's not only bad because the prices go up, it's bad because it signals that the money that we are all forced to use, right, by the governments that we mm-hmm. are citizens of. Yeah, it's just not good enough. It's just not good enough. So I'm, uh, people are already voting with their money by not using the money to save, right, but by acquiring homes to save in. But then, you know, I think we get to an interesting point where people say like, well, but I, and this is, I think, also a good differentiator to make, like, no, I'm investing in a home because it gives me cash flow, etc. But I think a good distinction to make is you think you should be an investor because you cannot save anymore. I think that's one. But then also the mm-hmm. argument of the entire, you know, cash flow narrative. I mean, there's an in- entire educational industry built upon, you know, leverage, compounding interest, cash flow, blah, blah, blah. People say like, no, I'm doing that to have cash flow, to earn more money, to combat inflation, right? I mean, like, it sounds like a logical reasoning. Like, h- how do you look at that? Yeah, and, and, and then I'll have a bit a question about what Bitcoin actually produces. For sure. So the way I look at that is, let's just take the major asset classes. We've got bonds, we've got real estate, and we've got stocks. Now, when we think about bonds, bonds on average over the last 100 years have returned around like 4 to 5% kind of annualized. When we think about real estate, real estate has returned around like 65 to 7.5% over the last 100 years. And when we think about stocks, they've returned on average 8 to 9%. Well, When we think about technological advancement, if you're able to strip out, and there's been a lot of studies done on this, if you're able to strip out monetary expansion, prices in many areas fluctuate between around like minus 5 to minus 15%. So prices should be falling between like 5 to 15%. Let's just take the middle ground on that. Let's just say 10%. Well, that means that if we adopt Bitcoin and ignoring all of the growth and appreciation as a result of adoption, let's just say Bitcoin was adopted globally and everyone was using it, If prices as a result of technological advancement were falling at 10%, that outperforms bonds at 5% to 6%, real estate at 6.5% to 7.5%, and stocks or equities at 8% to 9%. So all of a sudden, we're going to be incentivized to just simply hold in the currency. We're not going to use those things anymore because we're actually going to outperform their return by simply saving in the currency. And that's where I think today, the whole financial sector is effectively built upon this idea that our money is losing value and we need all these complex investment strategies to protect our purchasing power. But that's because our money is broken. When we have a broken money, Mm. you can simply save again. People, if they want to invest, they can go and invest. But saving and investing are different things. Saving should not require risk. Investing takes risk, but there's a potential for greater return. So I think that people are going to be a lot more conscious under a Bitcoin standard about what they invest in because it has to outperform the return of Bitcoin. So they have to be investing in something that they really believe is going to make a difference in society, which also means I think we're going to have a higher probability of success with startup companies. Today, 90% of startups fail and you're seeing billions of dollars pumped into these startup companies and most of it just evaporates. 
And it's not because there was a high probability of success, it's because they have nowhere else to go and they're just trying to protect purchasing power. So again, like this is all as a result of broken money. Yeah, so when someone says Bitcoin does not produce anything like the cash flow of my rental unit, my answer usually is that the output of Bitcoin is like an economic constant. It's it's the same thing forever, always. That's also the promise, right? Like these are my rules mm -hmm. and I'm gonna stay the same forever. And that's what gets checked every 10 minutes by all the nodes, etc. So I say, you know, this is the output. The output is that it's basically the only economic constant in the entire universe. That's where you can derive value from. I think we touched upon that before. But what is your reaction to this statement? Because people, yeah, they compare it from the paradigm that they're in. So they compare it with, let's say, a rental unit that produces cash flow. Well, and like, I, I wholeheartedly agree with what you're saying. And I think that the other way to look at it is when we think about the return on real estate over the last hundred years, annualizing between like six and a half to seven and a half, let's just take the middle ground, 7%. That 7% is not just appreciation. That 7% is also cash flows. And so with Bitcoin, if you have, let's just say, as a result of technological advancement, we ignore adoption and Bitcoin was just a steady appreciation of 10% over time. What would happen is it's outperforming real estate. It may not have direct cash flows, but if it's appreciating at 10% and real estate is appreciating at 7% with appreciation plus cash flows, you're outperforming real estate without those cash flows. You can still draw down on your Bitcoin, live on your Bitcoin, and still outperform real estate. And so this whole cash flow phenomenon, I think, is a result of Warren Buffett saying, I only invest in things that generate cash flows. I'm not going to invest in something that doesn't. But what that doesn't take into account is you can have something with appreciation that massively outperforms cash flows. Wow. Yeah, perfectly said. I, I, I think that's a, that, that, that is a great answer. I'm also thinking, if you are really on a Bitcoin standard, right? If we value everything, if, if Bitcoin is the, the standard measurement for human productivity, basically, and we measure everything, all our output, all the goods and services that we create in Bitcoin, and we are incentivized to actually deliver value to earn the best money to ever exist. I think there's some sort of like positive feedback loop in there, right? Like if you are incentivized to create value and you're incentivized to innovate and you eventually innovate in some type of topic or section where because you innovate, things become cheaper with the Bitcoin that you have left after your investment, you can probably then buy more of that thing that, that you innovated, right? So it's basically the incentives are are almost like switched compared to to fiat money as you alluded to before like you are, in, are incentivized to build to eventually profit from that what you what you build and that mm -hmm. in itself is it's an incentive that's not really existent in the current paradigm Absolutely. And it's, it's interesting as well. I like to look at it from that consumption a consumerist lens mm. and that is, Today, because obviously, as we mentioned, our money is breaking down and we're incentivized to consume, people are just buying whatever they can, when they can. And we're using products that just have such poor quality. Things are breaking down so quickly. And we're using resources that many times are obtained in unethical ways. Like it's something like 70% of the cobalt globally, which every single smartphone has like 14 grams or something like that of cobalt, 70% of cobalt globally is in inhumane conditions in like African nations. And companies like Apple, you name it, are still all using this cobalt because they've got no other means to do that. Well, what is interesting is if you were to have a monetary system that incentivizes saving, well, all of a sudden you're going to consume a lot less. So those companies that are not offering value are going to slowly wither away. But on top of that, the ones that are offering value are now having to compete for the minimal capital that's going into the consumption world. And so in order to go to compete, what do they do? They raise the quality of their products. They raise the standards. They raise what it is they're paying people. And we already start to see a glimpse of this in the outdoor world. Like I work and for a long time, I worked as a mountain bike instructor, I'm a big ski tourer, I paraglide. And so I love spending time in good quality clothing that is ethically sourced. Or in the outdoor world, there are people that they have a little more money than the average person. And so they're willing to direct their capital towards companies that are ethically produced uh, garments. They are using recyclable material. They are focusing on their environment. And so I think that it's really important and we're starting to see that as money starts to break down, we're de decimating our environment. But 
On the flip side, if we were to have a monetary system such as Bitcoin, it incentivizes greater quality products, greater competition, greater whatever it is that society values. And so I think that even on a consumerist lens, we would see a huge improvement in consumerism as a result of something like Bitcoin. Yeah, it's funny. I'm thinking I, I, I wouldn't order a parachute on AliExpress. But well, you know, more as like there are already examples where it's very clear that for some types of products or services, you know that, you know, cheap is definitely not the best, right? So, you, you know, there you have a more clear decision as to where you're uh, to allocate your, mm -hmm. your, your resources to basically. So, yeah, what, how, how do you think that, you know, I think it was Hayek who said, like, we need to find like a sly roundabout way, you know, to circumvent the government in order to break that money and state connection, right? Let's say we get there. And I, I also see, I, I, I do see it's already playing out like that, right? Mm -hmm. Like I believe in the, in the Bitcoin is a Trojan horse concept, because basically what we are trying to replace is all made up by people who are talking and not walking, right? And Bitcoin is the talk and the walk. So, you know, even though th they are so, how do you say, they're so arrogant that they think like, you know, you know, th this will never become that thing, you know, let them do this and that. And so I think eventually it is the it is the Trojan the Trojan horse. So I, I just love that concept in general. But let's say we get there. How would Bitcoin bring this transparency to politics? Is it what you alluded to before? You have to be actually responsible. You have to actually have a plan. Is it as simple as that? Or do you see more implications there? So that's a really good question. And I think that the way I view things is Bitcoin is super unique in that it's the first time we have a non-jurisdictional asset. And what do I mean by that? Well, every other asset in history is either tangible, is physically located. We have gold bricks, we have houses, we have physical cash, which means it can be easily seized if the government deems that, hey, I don't want you having that thing. I want to confiscate it. Alternatively, we have intangible assets, things like bonds and stocks and other financial products. But again, we don't hold those directly. They're held by third-party institutions. And so if the government wants to come down on that institution and say, hey, can you freeze that person's account? We don't want that person accessing those assets. It can do so very easily. We saw this during the trucker rally in Canada where people had their bank accounts frozen for simply donating to a cause. So the world we live in, every asset we've had up until this point has either been physical and easily seized or digital and held by a third party and therefore easily seized. Well, Bitcoin... We can now store 12 words in our head and we can hold that purchasing power ourselves, take self-custody, and no one has any idea that we're storing that purchasing power. I could walk across a border, start naked, and no one has any idea that I could have a billion dollars in my head and nobody knows. And this is profound. We've never had this before. And so this idea means that capital can flow to where value is being created in society or capital can flow to where nation states offer value. So if you're a nation state and you decide yes. to go more and more and more totalitarian or authoritarian, it's very hard for that nation state to obtain your Bitcoin. It's much easier for you to leave or flee and bring that capital with you. So that means now the government can't compensate capital to the same extent that it's been able to, which means it's unable to stop this drain of capital, which it needs capital to be able to fund operations, to be able mm. to pay down debt, to be able to meet debt obligations. So what I think it does with Bitcoin is it forces a free market. It forces a free market whereby if the government wants to obtain your Bitcoin, what does it have to do? It can't do it for, by force. It has to offer value and you have to voluntarily hand it over. So I think the world which we live in or what we're transitioning to is a world whereby value flows to where value is being created. So for governments to be able to thrive and exist, they need to be able to offer value and start listening to their populace. Mm -hmm. At the moment, it's the inverse whereby we're kind of subservient to the government because the government can fund operations regardless of whether we agree. The government can devalue the currency regardless of whether we agree. The government doesn't play by the same free market rules that small businesses have to play by. Whereas under a Bitcoin world, the government has to play by those rules. It has to listen to its populace and offer a value to be able to thrive. And I think that's really important. Yeah. yeah I think a good point to reiterate, I'd say, is that the government does not produce anything, mm -hmm. right? they have to create, they, they are actually like a manager in a big company, right? Like they have to create the environment for be, for people to do what they want to do, remove restrictions, etc., in order to heighten productivity, 
right? Make that higher. And so that the government, you know, taxing in some way or form can get revenues from that. I would say this is for me the concept of a state with taxes, right? Like they get the taxes and that's what they use to fund their managerial role to, you know, up the GDP even more. But the fact that they can do stuff without the people actually a- a- approving it and approving it does not mean like, well, there's a democracy, you voted for a party and there's another party who won, right? Like that majority thing, but like voting with your money, like approving that your money is actually used for any governmental operation or policy or whatever. The fact that that is not the case, I think for me was also a very big thing in learning about like why should Bitcoin exist? Like it is already happening. They actually don't even have to tax you. They actually don't even have to get revenue from their citizens to fund their operations (laughs) because they just create the money. So they actually don't help you by creating these policies, right? Because if the, when they create more money and devalue it, they inflate the prices and then we are back at inflation, right? So I see learning about Bitcoin as like finding a lot of signals that should show you that the, what you've learned about the stability of money or the stability of government or st- the stability of trade or value or entrepreneurship, consumerism, all, the, all these things is all wrong. <laughs> basically. That's it's, kind of how my journey went. No, and, and you bring up such a good point, which is this idea of the government is capitalizing off others' success. And the reality is that there's only two yes. types of people in society. There are creators, people that create value for society, and there are capitalizers, people that take the value that others have created and either redistribute it or try to take advantage of it. And when we think about government, I'm not saying that there is no value in government, but what I am saying is that the majority of what government does today is ineffective and inefficient, and they don't have an incentive to change that. Whereas if the government, if the only way that they could obtain capital was to offer value to society, well, they now have to be a fiscally responsible entity like any other business. And if they have to be a fiscally responsible entity like any other business, they have to balance their books. And if they're balancing their books and their incomings and outgoings, they've got to recognize, hey, this department, well, we're regulating this whole industry, but we're not seeing any return on this. We're not seeing any benefit from this. We're going to have to cut back 90% of the jobs. Oh, this department, we're going to have to cut back 90% of the jobs. And what that means is, I believe under a a world where money is separated from state, the government is a lot smaller. The challenge Mm. we face right now is here in Canada, the average public job, the average public sector job, government job, pays 10% more than the average private sector job. So what that means is, you're starting to see the the public sector slowly engulf the private sector. We've seen a huge growth in public sector jobs. It's the same in the States. It's the same in the UK. It's the same in most of these countries where because they can pay above average wages because they don't actually have to think about productivity, efficiency, and being profitable, they're slowly engulfing the private sector. Mm -hmm. And that's not a viable economy. Yeah. Also thinking this incentive game or game theory works for small government as well, right? If you Mm -hmm. have a small government that has to compete to be able to tax a hard money like Bitcoin, they are incentivized to be productive and not to grow unnecessarily, right? So to yeah. to stay small. I love Bitcoin so much. Yes, like it's this is freaking amazing. It's, it's, stuff it's amazing. like this is so interesting, dude. Yeah, you and know, I think like one, yeah. one of the ones during the pandemic that really stood out to me is when we think about like the pharmaceutical industry. Now, if we're a government and we have kind of the FDA, let's just say the Food and Drug Administration. Well, at the moment, they're bought by major pharmaceutical companies. And so their agenda is to push pharmaceuticals, to push certain like prescription medication, vaccines, you name it, because they're bought by these major pharmaceutical companies. Well, the interesting thing is, if you're a government and all of a sudden you now have to balance your books, well, you've got to think about, okay, how do we create the most efficient society? How do we improve the health of our economy without just pumping capital into the economy and intervening. Well, now we've got to think about the health of our economy from a more holistic sense. Maybe we got to go into the school system and educate what health really means. Educate about diet, educate about the physiology, getting out and doing exercise, because that's actually the cheapest, most effective way to improve the health of our economy, not paying for interventionistic approaches such as medication, you name it. And so I think that it flips the incentives. When people Mm. are incentivized to balance their books financially, They've got to look at incomings and outgoings. If they want to improve the health of the economy, they've got to look at it from a more holistic sense rather than an interventionistic sense. Yeah, and and even the idea around education, I find interesting because I think, you know, Bitcoin 
cannot be stopped anymore, right? So it's here already. And I think as Jeff Booth says, like you can vote with your money. That means if you choose another money, you can just do that today, right? Like you don't have to wait in order to do that. But because Bitcoin is so decentralized and it's worldwide, if you set up a business, for example, where you homeschool kids virtually and you get paid in Bitcoin, you know, you homeschool them in whatever way, could even be on health or, you know, whatever, wh however you would want to do that. And you can find people around the world that share your values. You can actually already not only break free and choose another money, but we can we are also decentralizing education in that way already. So there's there's so many of these like second and third order effects of adopting Bitcoin as a money that from the perspective that I have now would only be good. I think as you said to before, like you're actually going to think about what is the value that I deliver? Is that enough? Do I enjoy doing this, right? Like people are gonna ask themselves these questions and eventually act accordingly. I would say, because you have <laughs> to follow the incentive, even if it's forced upon you also with negative incentives, right? I think that's what we talked about a lot, but also if the positive incentive is forced upon you, then yeah, you, you're going to follow it. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Perfectly said. So if we are moving towards a moment where, you know, the fiat money, the house of fiat money cards comes falling down, how would that look like? Like, what is your idea of that? Or do you think something like that could be saved by Bitcoin already? Do you think that's going to happen? Like, what's your what's your idea on that? It's so tough. I think that many times we want the world to be black and white. We want to have confidence in what is going to happen. And I think this, how we see this transition, assuming if it's one of the most, I've never been so certain in my life, even though there's no such thing as certainty, how we see this transition is going to be a tough one. Uh, I think that it would not surprise me, given the amount of instability, given the amount of debt we see in society, if we were to see a catastrophic failure in the next year or two, such as like the depression, where all of a sudden people are feeling so much pain, they're just like, look, there's a system over there and people are actually, life is getting easier for them and life is only getting harder in this system. The pain of staying in this system is far greater than transitioning to a new system. And so we see a rapid transition within like a two, three, five year window. I think that that is possible. At the same time, there's always this saying in the financial markets when you're trading, the market can stay rational for longer than you can stay solvent. And I can also see a world whereby we just see more and more and more intervention prolonging this the kind of debt bubble, this inflationary bubble. And this could extend on for another 15, 20, 25 years. What I do believe, though, is that the more we see intervention, the more people are going to start moving into other assets. And that includes things like Bitcoin. And if Bitcoin continues to appreciate, eventually people are not going to be able to ignore it. And what I think is amazing about Bitcoin is that they always say, price is what brings me in, but I kind of stay for the, what is it? The uh, revolution. Like, yeah. yeah, stay for the revolution. And I think that that's what's amazing about Bitcoin is the number go up technology is such a draw for people because people just want to be able to have more capacity to show up in life. And so I think that as Bitcoin's price continues to appreciate, we're going to see more people move over to Bitcoin. And that is going to kind of create this kind of herd mentality, this transition. And so I think the transition is happening, whether or not it's in the next couple of years, whether or not it's in the next kind of 20 to 30 years, that I'm not 100% sure because I think it could go either way. Yeah, I, I had a tweet about this last week. I shared, I love going on Reddit in the Bitcoin Reddit or Millennials Reddit, right? Like seeing like these posts of people that said, like, I think I finally get Bitcoin, you know, and then we, I saw this, <laughs> I saw this post that said, I think I finally get the idea behind Bitcoin and I literally can't sleep. I love, I love that. But then I shared another one where someone said, you know, when you understand Bitcoin, you can't look back. But I tweeted, you know, this is why I think Bitcoin is a mind virus. Like you said, they can intervene and print money, et cetera, but it's going to speed up, right? Like more and more people are going to feel something's going on. I cannot buy the same things that I, but before, I mean, you see these TikToks with people who buy the same groceries one year later, right? And it's up 200%, you know, more than what you see on the TV, quote, quote unquote. But like, so, so I think it's a mind virus, right? And I think like, so what I tweeted was no one can ignore inflation. Like you will have to adopt because the money printing just cannot stop. Like there's no fiscal responsibility, et, et cetera. Like they, they just have to do it, right? It can't stop. So you just have to accept that they can't stop. They will debase it in into infinity, basically, you can only vote for another move, money by just moving to it. 
And then I, I ended it with like, it's pretty enjoyable over here. And that's the question I wanted to ask you, like, what has Bitcoin given you? What are you sleeping better? Like, what has it given you? I, it's interesting. Like we, we talk about like the ethos of Bitcoiners. Bitcoin for me really has changed just how I show up in the world. Like earlier, we talked about these kind of these three changes of behavior as a result of money. And those are first our time preference. Well, for me, I have a much lower time preference. Like Bitcoin can fluctuate. Bitcoin can drop this last cycle. What from 2021 at the high to the low, it dropped something like 70, 75%. And it didn't didn't even bat an eyelid. Like, and it, I never thought in my lifetime I could see an asset drop 70, 75%. And for me to not really question it because I just had confidence in its trajectory. So I've seen my time preference, my ability to look to the future change drastically as a result of Bitcoin. I'm thinking more about how I want to show up. I'm thinking more about what it is that I value and what kind of future I want to build and how I want to leave my mark on this world. And then when I think about compassion and altruism, as my purchasing power goes up, like I think I've always been quite a supportive, generous person. I want to try and give back to society throughout even my teenage years. I've kind of volunteered with a lot of nonprofits, but Bitcoin has given me greater capacity to do so. It's given me much greater capacity to be able to support others that are in challenging situations. And then finally, the meaninglessness and apathy. What's amazing about Bitcoin is that Bitcoin is giving me meaning, not only because as I have greater purchasing power, I'm able to show up more authentically and pursue things that motivate me, but even just being in the Bitcoin space has been one of the most rewarding things I've ever done in my life. Like I used to, for 10 years, I taught mountain biking and I absolutely loved it. I loved being able to support people growing in a sport, getting to know their body and how to kind of move in order to be able to perform certain maneuvers on the bike. But I, at the tail end of it, I was kind of like, as much as I enjoy this, I'm just kind of helping someone with a little kind of hobby on this, on, on like a little side hobby. Whereas what I love about Bitcoin is that when we're supporting people and helping people understand the world around them, it's giving them greater capacity to show up in all areas of their life. And I think that that for me is just so unbelievably rewarding to be able to help educate and to be able to be a part of this incredible community. And so Bitcoin really has changed my time preference. It's changed my capacity to give back. It's changed my capacity to have find meaning in life. Like I think Bitcoin to me is completely pivoted to the trajectory of my life. I love, I love that you shared it. I, I feel the same. I, I feel the exact same. And I hope that just by having this conversation and many more conversations that people are also inspired by that, right? Because eventually you have to do the work yourself and challenge your own ego. And I think you are a great example of someone who embodies that. And yeah, so I just, I just absolutely love that answer, man. I think that's really great. I think that's a great example to, to show to other people and your motivation to educate people, I think, shines through that. So yeah, I think that's, I think that's very cool. No, that really, it really means a lot, Bram. And I think that like it's a hundred percent mutual. Like I see how much energy you put into this podcast and the, the time and dedication it takes to put something like this together. And like I'm, I'm sure I speak for everyone in the Bitcoin community. Like we really value having you, and we're we're so pumped to have you on side. I love being on on this team. So thank, thanks for that. I I wanted to close this out with my last question which I ask everyone the same question, which is what is a core belief that you will never let go? Oh, you know, I think throughout my life, I've had a few experiences that have just really pushed me to critically think about the world around us. And I think the world which we live in as a result of broken money has meant that we have got less and less capacity to think about the world around us, to critically think about the information we're consuming. And so kind of a core belief for me is really trying to show up authentically and kind of have strong opinions loosely held where I'm willing to question the world around me and critically think about the information that I'm consuming. Because when I think about where I am now to where I was even five years ago, 10 years ago, I had this puzzle of what I thought the world would look like. And I've removed so many pieces and changed those pieces out as a result of changing information and changing my own belief structures. And so I really believe at the heart of everything that I do, I, I, I want to try and stay, stay true to questioning the world around me and critically thinking about the world around me. And I urge everyone else around you to, if you have a belief that you're holding on to, whatever that belief is, ask yourself, like, where did that belief come from? Like, why do I have this belief? Is it founded upon strong, like, is it founded on just an opinion? Is it founded on fact? And just to critically think and analyze the world around us. I think it's so important. Love that, dude. Can you read this? A tattoo? Learn every day. That's amazing. Exactly. Wholeheartedly. I fully, fully, fully agree. I think that 
the world we live in, unfortunately, as technology is advancing from the social media perspective, I think the the information we're consuming is getting smaller and smaller and smaller as we're getting shorter attention spans. And it's meaning that we're not really able to decipher the world around us. We don't have a complete picture of how things work. And I fully urge like anyone who's listening to this, like to trend more towards long form content, long form podcasts, books, you name it, because the amount of yes. information you can consume from something like a book versus a tweet is just on a factor of a thousand, like far, far, exactly. far greater. Yeah. And so yes. I urge people to read. Great conversation, man. Really, really, really enjoyed this. Thank you so much. And I appreciate all your work. I will link to your Twitter account, the book. People can check that out. And uh, yeah, let's stay in touch and do it again sometime. Absolutely. And for anyone listening, like, so a lot of the topics we've discussed, I discuss in my book, The Hidden Cost of Money. But more than anything, I don't want price to be a barrier. And so if someone cannot afford the book, but they want to kind of learn more, just reach out on Twitter, which is just said Bunny, B-U-N-N-E-Y. And I'm more than happy to send over the ebook for free because I don't think price should be a barrier to education. But again, Bram, I really, really appreciate this. It's been an honor to talk and I'm looking forward to the next time. Cheers, mate. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, also make sure to check out this video right here or go to my page and check out all the episodes of Bitcoin for Millennials. I appreciate your support and hope to see you for another episode. Bye.